Welcome everyone to our brand new episode of the Metal Mat Podcast. And today, um, this is going to be the second to last episode of the Metal Mat Podcast for 2015. And today, we are going to be doing hmm, my top 10 albums of 2015. Yes, it's that time again. And uh, actually, I actually did my top 10 albums of 2014 um, back in February. So this is a little bit early for me. This is really the right time when I should be doing it. I don't know why I waited until February to do it. But um, in any event, I'm going to be doing top 10 albums of 2015. So let's go ahead and get started. First of all, some shout outs very quickly. First of all, Chucky's Playground, great place to be. If you haven't checked it out, definitely check it out. Um, really a great place for Chucky fans, for non-Chucky fans. It's just an awesome place to hang out. So definitely sign up if you haven't already. It's, it's just a very cool place to be. And Movie Mayhem with Spanky and G are an awesome podcast um, with good friends Spanky and G. They talk about all kinds of movies, and it's a pretty entertaining podcast, so go check them out. And so now we get to my top 10 albums of 2015. So let's go ahead and talk about my top 10 favorite albums that came out this year. So let's go ahead and start at number 10. Marilyn Manson, The Pale Emperor. And this might come as a bit of a shock or surprise or whatever at how low it's sort of gotten. Because anybody who knows me knows that I am a huge fan of Marilyn Manson. And, uh, I mean, I think the Marilyn Manson retrospective that I did um, last year in October, um, I think that might be my longest episode to date of my podcast because I think that ran like 50 minutes or something. So, yeah, definitely my longest episode, I think, um, because I just had so much to talk about when it came to Marilyn Manson. Because uh, I am a really big fan of the guy and the band. And, you know, he, one of my favorite bands ever. But um, to say that The Pale Emperor was one of their stronger albums, I'd be lying if I said that. Because, I don't know, just something about this album um, just did not click for me. Like, when I first bought the album, and I first bought the album, um, a few days after it came out, and I bought it, and when I, when I first heard it in its entirety, I was not a big fan of it, I, I just wasn't, uh, I, it just sounded too off for a Marilyn Manson album, and I know that he likes to experiment, and I can respect that, but at the same time, it, it just was not the Marilyn Manson that I was used to. At least when he would experiment, he would still sound a little like Marilyn Manson. But here, he didn't really sound much like him. But now that I've actually had, now that I've had the album for nearly a year, um, and now that I've kind of lived with the album, it, it has grown on me. It really has. Um, I do like a lot of, a uh, few songs on there, like I like Deep Six and Mesopheles of Los Angeles, or however you say that, Mesopheles or whatever. Um, Slave Only Dreams Be King. I, I I like those songs, you know. So I think it has a handful of good songs, but I think the rest is a little bit forgettable. Not really that good. Um, in the genre, it's interesting for maybe a couple songs, but by the end of the album, it just sort of it, it kind of runs its course for a bit. Like, basically, imagine if Four Rusted Horses off the high and the low was made into an entire album, and that's basically what this is. And Four Rusted Horses was a good song, but you know. I think something like that, it really should only be like one or two songs on an album. I don't really think it should be an, an entire album. So I think The Pale Emperor is a step down from um, Marilyn Manson albums. Like I like Born Villain, um, his previous album, a lot better than this one. But at the same time, I think that there were a pretty some pretty good songs on here. And I think the good songs on here were really good. And so that, that gets the number 10 spot for me. Number 9. Operation Mind Crime. The Key. And I know that a lot of people 
really like the hate on Jeff Tate nowadays. I'm not, um, not I'm really not sure why that is necessarily, but um, personally, when this when he sort of announced this sort of like solo project um, that he was going to be m making a band called Operation Mind Crime, um, I was pretty interested to say the least. You know, because I like concept albums, and when he, when he announced that it was going to be um, th this series of concept albums, I was really excited. And I think this album is it's pretty good. I think I think you know it should get a lot more credit than it did because I think I do think there are some good songs um, on here. Um, Burn is a really good one. Reinventing the Future is great. Um, um, kicking in the door is really is a really good one as well. There's a few um, little instrumental pieces, I guess, in here that are, are pretty cool. And one thing I do like about it is that it does live up to the band name. And when you name your band some after like a really big concept album, like probably arguably one of the best rock operas of all time. You know, when you're naming after one of the greatest albums of all time, you know, you have a standard to live up to, you know. But I do think that they do it well. And I, I think this sort of kind of achieves what Operation Minecraft 2 was trying to. And I think that it, it sort of, it gets the spirit of the original Minecraft album, but it sort of adds these um, these new little quirks to it that make it really modern, and I really like that because a lot of these tracks I could really see being on the original. I kicking in the door, I could see on the original. Um, Reinventing the future, I could see on the original album. So I think it really it, it really captures the spirit of the original Minecraft album. But it also has an, a few twists and turns of modernization um, to really give that kick. And I, and I really like this album. I really like the key. I think it's a really good album. And I'm really interested to see what else Operation Mindcrime is going to do. Because I think it's pretty interesting. Number 8. Faith No More. Soul Invictus. Now, for the longest time, this was my number 1 album of the year. But, to be fair, that was released in May, so we didn't really have a live competition. And, I mean, for most of the summer of 2015, this year, we didn't really have too many albums out. Or, if we did, there weren't too many good ones. Um, but, I think this one is still really good, even though it's a little bit low on the list. Uh, mainly because, I think... Uh, the albums I'm going to be talking about in a minute are a little bit better than this one. But I do like this album. Um, it's Faith No More's first album in a long time, nearly 20 years actually. Um, because their previous album, Album of the Year, was released in 1997. So it's been a long time um, since they made an album. And this album, you know, it's basically what you would expect from Faith No More. You know, basically has that Faith No More sound. And I, I think it's really good. Superhero, I think, ranks up there already with some of the very best that they've done. And um, just a lot of good songs here. I mean, there's really not much to say. But if you're a Faith No More fan, you're definitely going to like this one. Because it's a really cool return. Number 7. Kurt Cobain, Montage of Hex Soundtrack. And um, this was one thing that I was really looking forward to most of the year. And uh, I was watching the Montage of Heck um, movie back around April, I think. I think that was when it came on. And I really liked that movie. And if you remember, I actually did a review of that as a Mel Matt podcast episode. And you can watch that. But, I mean, I really like this album. I really think it's pretty cool. And uh, I think this is one of the few times where I think the deluxe version of the album is much better than their regular version. And that's what I mean. If you really want to experience the full montage of heck um, experience, you have to get the deluxe version. 
And I don't normally say that because, you know, a lot of deluxe versions of, you know, albums, you know, that are sort of pointless. You don't really need to get them, but really in the world to really experience the full, you know, capabilities of montage of heck. You know, you really need to get the deluxe version. And I think the deluxe version is a lot more interesting than the regular version. It has a lot of cool little features to it. Like it has um, Kurt's um, narration of the scene from Montage of Heck. It has a few um, audio recordings at home. That's basically what it is. Basically home recordings. And it's pretty cool to sort of get into the mind of Kurt Cobain. So I think this is pretty cool. Number six, Cradle of Filth, Hammer of the Witches. And, you know, this is a pretty cool little album. You know, I, I, honestly, I think it's probably Cradle of Filth's best album um, in quite a while. It feels just a lot more focused, you know, than it usually is. And I, I mean, I just really like this album. It's really heavy, you know, really atmospheric, especially with the intro. Um... I don't know, there's not too much to say about this one, just a really good album, you know, if you're into extreme metal, death metal, black metal, whatever you want to call it, if you're into the, the kind of music that Cradle of Filth does, um, this is a really good album, so if you're into that kind of music and that kind of subgenre of heavy metal, the death metal, black metal, whatever you want to call it, then definitely check this one out. Number 5, Fear Factory, Genexus. And I think this is a really good album. You know, I, I don't know if I say I'm the biggest Fear Factory fan in the world, though I do like a lot of their stuff. But um, sort of their albums have been kind of forgettable the past few years or so. But I think this one is really good. Um, Fear Factory basically, they're an industrial metal band, which I really like, but they're kind of an interesting um, hybrid. You know, because sometimes they can go, they're sort of like um, a, a crossover between thrash metal or death metal and industrial metal. It's, a, it's an interesting hybrid, uh, to say the least. But I think this album has probably some of their best songs um, in quite a while. Like I think Soul Hacker is really good. You know, so I, I really like this album. Number four. Foo Fighters, St. Cecilia. Now, I know that I'm sort of cheating with this one here because it technically isn't a full album. It's only an EP. But here's the thing. It's my list, so I can do whatever I want with it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Foo Fighters, St. Cecilia. This one was a surprise to me because I was not expecting this one at all. I was not expecting Foo Fighters to release an album, or at least an EP, but, um, it was pretty cool to see Foo Fighters release something new, um, and this EP is really good, like, it is just so good, and, like, the, the opening track, which is the title track, it, it's a little bit bland, it's a little bit forgettable, but, you know, I can sort of forgive that, because the rest of the album just rocks, I mean, it's sort of, I don't know, it's kind of hard to describe, honestly, but I, I do think that, I mean, like, you know, a lot of the album is really good. I think that's what I'm trying to say here. And a lot of the album, very much, very fast-paced. It's very, you know, hard rock, you know. You got Save Your Breath, which is really good. And we got Iron Rooster, which is pretty atmospheric in a way. You know, it sort of has a different sound to it. I mean, it's just a really good album. I don't know if I'd say it's as good as Sonic Highways. And I think I ranked Sonic Highways pretty pretty high up in um, last year's top 10 list. So, but I do think this is just as good. You know, I can't really judge it along with Sonic Highways since this is just an EP and we only get five songs on here. But I think those five songs really do rock, and they they really are just awesome. Number three, Hollywood Vampires, Hollywood Vampires, and this is a pretty cool little supergroup that consists of Alice Cooper, Johnny Depp, and I guess technically Joe Perry. Like they 
like they say that Joe Perry is a member of the, of the group, um, but he really only plays on like a couple of songs on this particular album. But uh, I guess they're considered like a trio of supergroup. Um, but yeah, when I first heard about this, I was pretty excited. But at the same time, you know, since this is a cover album, I wasn't sure what was going to happen because, you know, like I've said time and time again, you know, cover albums can be pretty hit and miss, honestly. I can like some of them, some of them I don't like, you know. So it was going to be pretty hit and miss for me. But I think, I think this is a really good album, you know, and I was really torn with these top three, because I was not sure at all how to rank my top three albums on this list, because all three of them were just really good. And uh, I think all the covers, most of the covers here really do rock. This just begins with a narration by Christopher Lee, which is really cool. Um, We have two original tracks here, Raise the Dead and My Dead Drunk Friends, and both of them are just really good. And the covers are pretty cool as well. Not all of them hit the mark. You know, like, I think some of them are a little forgettable. Like, I got a line on you and Jeepster and Cold Turkey. I didn't really think was that um, memorable. But the stuff that's really good is really good. Like, I love the whole lot of love cover. I really do. And um, Ichiku Park is really good as well. Um, there's just a lot of great stuff like that, you know, and the medleys on here are pretty cool as well. Like five to one slash break on through the other side. Um, one slash jump in the fire is really good as well. And I really like the medley between schools out and another brick in the wall part two. I think those two songs end up going together surprisingly well. You know, at first, at first glance, you know, you don't really picture those songs, um, going together the way that they do, but when you hear them back to back, you know, like, yeah, they really do fit together. So I think this is a really good covers album. I was not expecting it to sort of go the way it did because, you know, I'm sort of apprehensive about cover albums, but I think this is probably one of the best cover albums I've ever listened to, honestly. And I'm really hopeful that this super group really does something like this again. Um, cause I think, um, this little band that they have here, which consists of Alice Cooper, Johnny Depp, Joe Perry, and they have a bunch of other guys that make special guest appearances, like Perry Farrell of Jane's Addiction, um, guest stars on here, Brian Johnson of ACDC, guests on here. So they have a lot of cool guest stars in a way. And I'm really interested to see if they if they ever ever do another album again. Or if this is just going to be like a one-time thing. So, I'm, I don't know. But I'm, I'm hopeful that they do something else again. Because I think this this was a pretty good album. A really good album. Number two. Iron Maiden. The Book of Souls. And I really like this album. Uh, it's been a few years since we've had um, an Iron Maiden album. And I already went into detail about Iron Maiden and this album in particular um, in the Iron Maiden retrospective that I did a few months ago. So I'm not going to spend too much time here on it, but um, I think it still holds up a few months later. I think it's a really good double album. Um, Pretty cool, really atmospheric. Um, I just really like this album. Not much to say. I've already pretty much said my thing in in the retrospective, but this is just a really good album. No, again, really tough to decide between the top three albums which one was the best. Um, but this one really good. Sometimes, like when I first listened to it, it and when we do it first listen to it, you know, it can be kind of a little bit tough to kind of sink in a little bit because it is such a long album. You know, it's probably Iron Maiden's longest album to date. But, uh, and I think you do sort of have to be in, like, the right mood to sort of listen to it. Um, but I think when you do, you know, when it does sink in, you know, that it is an Iron Maiden album, it is a double album. It, it, in some ways, it's sort of a concept album, kind of. But I really do like this album, and I think it really does rock. And before I get to number one specifically, let's talk about a couple of honorable mentions that I want to... Um, just sort of mention very briefly, because I do like a lot of albums from this year, and I just want to mention 
Um, a few honorable mentions real quick. Number one would be Def Leppard. Def Leppard. And I went into Def Leppard's album not with very low expectations, I have to say. Because I think Def Leppard's... A lot of their recent stuff hasn't been very good. Um, it's just been okay at best or just really forgettable. So I went into this... Not really expecting anything good, but I was honestly surprised by this one. Like, it's not their best album that they've ever done. You know, it just isn't. But, at the same time, though, I really do like this album. The Really, the only problem that I have is that the ballads are pretty weak on here, honestly. I think um, if the ballads were gone, this album probably would have made the cut. But yeah, like if the the ballads weren't that weak, or if they were just off the album in general, I probably would have put the album on the list, albeit at probably like number nine or so. But um, really, the ballads are really the only thing that sort of stops this album from being really great. Like the rocker songs, they're not like masterpieces or anything like that, but they're pretty good. Like they're better than the usual Death Leopard fare. You know what I mean? So I, I did like this album. And number two would be Red Man Mudface. And I know that's probably a little surprising, um, given that a list by Metal Matt. But, you know, the truth is, I actually do listen to a lot of music that you, that you probably wouldn't expect me to listen to. Like, honestly, even though heavy metal is my favorite genre, you know... Yeah, like, I try to listen to, like, a lot of music, you know, heavy metal is my favorite genre, but I'll go, I'll go my way to listen to, you know, a lot of genres, like, modern pop, I like some modern pop, not all of it, but some of it, um, I can, I can listen to some rap, again, not a lot, but some, really the only genre that I just outright hate, or outright refuse to listen to is country, like, I cannot stand the country genre, but with that said, you know, I think Red Face, um, Red Man's Mud Face is pr pretty good. It's a pretty good rap album. It's certainly better than his previous album, Reggie. Um, so, so this was pretty a pretty good album. Um, it would have made the list, but I just like the top ten top ten albums on the list just a little bit better. But this one is still really good. And finally, number three, Saint Saint Asanya, Saint Asanya. And this is um, Adam Gontier's um, new new band, After Three Days Grace. And I do think that this is a pretty solid album. Um, you know, basically, if you're looking into the album for Three Days Grace, you're not really going to find it here. You know, while Adam's voice will remind you of Three Days Grace, I mean, you, you sort of can't help but hear Three Days Grace whenever he sings, because I think he is that band. He is Three Days Grace. But um, I think the band is just something completely different from anything that he's done um, with Three Days Grace. I do think it's a solid album. I think Better Praise is a really good song, a really good lead single. So, yeah, I think San Sonia's album is pretty solid. So, those are all my honorable mentions for this year. And so, now we get to the number one album of 2015. My personal pick for my number one album of 2015. Say it with me now. Slayer! Yes, Slayer. With Slayer Repentless. And anybody who watched my Slayer retrospective probably saw this coming. A Slayer Repentless, definitely my favorite album of 2015. Um, we waited a long time for it, you know, waited quite a few years for it, several years. And I, I think the wait was worth it. You know, again, a, a bit of a new lineup here. We got a new drummer, new guitarist. So, um, you know, sort of a, a painful album uh, in terms of the original lineup sort of being half gone. Um, Jeff Heyman unfortunately died, and um, Dave Rombardo leave, leaving. But, um, 
I think Gary Holt is a really good guitarist. I think he is a fitting replacement, honestly. And um I'm trying to think of who the drummer was. Um his name is his name is escaping me right now. Paul Paul Bosef, that's it, Paul Bosef. I think he's a really great drummer. Um I think he really deserves more credit uh than he gets. I mean obviously it's a tough task to replace Dave Lombardo. But I do think he does a really good job here. Probably the best drumming he's ever done with Slayer. You know, and that comes from someone who absolutely loves, you know, the God Hates Us All albums and um, the Divine Intervention album. But um, I think this one is really good. You know, it's classic Slayer. You know, you get what you you sort of know what you're going to get here. You know, it's classic Slayer. You get your mid tempo thrash songs, you get your high-tempo, fast-paced Slayer songs, you know, you pretty much get it all here, you know, I, I already talked about the album, you know, in great length on the Slayer retrospective, so I'm not going to waste too much time here on this one, but it's a great album, fantastic, if you're a metal fan, definitely check it out, you know, Slayer makes a triumphant return, and Slayer Penalist, that is most definitely my favorite album of 2015. So that's it for this episode of the Melmet Podcast. You know, counting down my top 10 favorite albums of 2015 with Sway Repentless getting the number one spot. But that those are my top 10 personal favorite albums along with a few honorable mentions here and there. So what were your top 10 favorite albums of this year? You can let me know in the comment section on this video, or you can let me know on my Twitter. I, I'm at, I'm at MelMat15. My Twitter is at MelMat15. So you can let me know there. You can let me know in the comment section on this video. So what were your top 10 favorite? I definitely like to hear it. You know, I like to hear from everybody, really. And uh, But those were my top 10 favorite albums of 2015. So thank you all for listening. And as far as what's next to come, we only have a couple more weeks until the end of 2015, but we're going to end it strong. Um, I believe next week I'm going to try and do a Star Wars retrospective, you know, because the new Star Wars movie comes out next week, so I'm going to try and do a retrospective on all of those. I mean, I rarely do movie retrospectives anymore because I think I'm a lot better at doing music than movies. But with something like Star Wars, you pretty much have to do it, don't you? <laughs> but, um, so that, that I have that plan for next week. And I believe the final week of 2015, I'm going to try and do some sort of year-end review of my YouTube channel. I'm not sure if that's going to happen, but I'm going to try and get that done. So, that's pretty much it for this episode. So, thank you all for listening. Let me know what your favorite album of 2015 was in the comments or on Twitter. Uh, So, thank you for listening to this episode, and I will see you all next time.